worship team come forward for the call to worship, please. Yeah. 
Please be seated for the reading of the psalm. Our psalm today is Psalm 113. We'll say it responsibly. I will begin with the first verse and continue with the odd, and you respond with the even. Beginning to read Psalm 113 at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and the princes of their people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Our next hymn is number 182, My Savior's Love. 182. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful. 
Now together we'll say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And another thank you, Lord. Thank you for my new wood splitter. And keep me and everybody who uses it safe. Thank you, Jesus. Bring forth your gifts into God's temple and make good your vows to the Most High. seated for special music. The epistle reading this morning is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, 
for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying, and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. The Gospel is from Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give me an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master has taken away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you, do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commanded the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The word and gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Hallelujah. Our parable today from Jesus is, in my, in my own particular case, one of those that just like, so I understand the para, parable of the Good Samaritan. I understand the parable of the prodigal son, lost son. I understand the parable of the wheat and the tares. It's, they're all challenging, uh, but I, I get the point. Uh, and I understand the end of this parable, you know, you can't serve both uh, God and money. I understand the end of it, but how Jesus gets there is a puzzle to me. And so uh, I did some, some pretty serious research on this. And so why would Jesus say, use worldly wealth to gain friends uh, so that perhaps you will be accepted uh, into eternal dwellings. Uh, just, uh, you know, it just seems like, wait a second, you can't buy your way into heaven, we know that. And uh, so all these pieces just, you know, sort of like, they don't fit together. And it's not pretty, necessarily. But it's memorable. So let's talk about this, and 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 so, but I I, I want to 
to focus in on that in just a sec. But one of the things, this, there's a direct connection here for me that I want to talk about is this. Last night uh, we watched uh, the movie from, geez, it must be 70, 80 years ago. Can you imagine? African Queen has Humphrey Bogart and Katharine Hepburn. Uh, it's just an absolutely marvelous movie. Uh, and John Huston was the director, and the amount of talent that went into that movie is really uh, stunning. Uh, amazing, amazing, amazing. And so just very briefly, I want to uh, share the characters. Humphrey Bogart is a, a riverboat captain that brings supplies up the, I guess it's, he calls it the Lambezi River, which is upriver from the Congo River. And, and uh, anyways, there is way up in Central Africa this mission settlement. And uh, there are Christian missionaries there, and, and so this boat that Dr. Bogart is, he's called Charlie, uh, that uh, he's the captain of, he brings supplies and mail and, and stuff like, uh, you know, monthly or, or bi weekly or something like that, and he is their supply line. And so the movie begins at this missionary settlement. There's uh, a brother and a sister who are sort of getting on in years. And the time is roughly around the time of World War I. And, uh, and so there's, the, you know, you hear this church service going on and the camera focuses in and they're having a, a church service and Catherine Hepburn is the sister who is, um, uh, playing the organ, and Robert Morley is the brother, who's the minister, who's directing the congregation in the song, and they're singing, and the all the uh, all the people that are in the congregation, uh, and these, these are villagers, they're uh, you know Central African villagers. This is a mission, are there sort of humming along in manner of speaking. And so they're right in the middle of this hymn that uh, uh, they're sort of singing, and then they hear the whistle of the riverboat come up like that. And so, uh, boom, all of a sudden, church is over. <laughs> in other words, everybody leaves because the uh, riverboat captain is bringing supplies and stuff. So there's this scene where they invite, that is, the two missionaries, brother and sister, invite the riverboat captain to have tea and crumpets. Really sort of a very proper, these, these folks are British and they do things properly. They do tea and crumpets properly. They do everything properly and they're very careful about it. They're, even though it's 100 degrees and, and, uh, and humid and as Central Africa is, uh, they're wearing you know proper, uh, proper clothes and, and they're wearing white and sweating terribly. And, and the, and Humphrey Bogart comes in as a riverboat captain, and he's uh, not dressed well, and he's got a five-day-old beard, and uh, he's just not proper. He's, he's, uh, so there's this beautiful contrast that you get where uh, uh, the brother and sister, the missionaries, are very prim and proper and trying to sort of have civilization in the midst of, of the wilderness, and, and uh, then the riverboat captain, uh, somebody who functions well in the wilderness comes and has tea and crumpets with them and so their the brother and sister are talking about churchy things very proper English churchy things and all of a sudden Humphrey Bogart he hasn't gotten his crumpets yet and so his belly starts grumbling loudly in the midst of this conversation between the brother and the sister so the point of my, me bringing this forward here is that you've got this, this sort of image that's being presented in this movie, African Queen, of these very sort of ridiculously prim and proper missionaries, servants of God, servants of Christ, uh, talking about churchy things. And uh, then you've got this riverboat captain who sort of represents, uh, you know, the uh, the, the man who functions well uh, in all kinds of circumstances, including the, the wilderness and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and there's just such this brilliant contrast between the, the churchy people and the, the riverboat captain. Now, my point about bringing all this up is that we're not churchy people that way. We're not British, for one thing. 
I haven't had tea and crumpets for like decades. I don't know if I ever have had tea and crumpets. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but just it's an interesting insight into how culture and the world sort of views Christians. And of course, the, the movie goes on with, it's a great story, and I highly recommend you watch it. It's beautifully written, uh, beautifully done, uh, just a fantastic story, uh, and beautifully presented. But just my point here is about the public image of Christians as being ridiculously prim and proper in a wilderness of uh, just like everything going on and bad things and good things and the person who functions well is not the churchy people but the riverboat captain who's very practical and uh and that sort of thing now the point of all this is that as christians we're not prim and proper we're faithful and honest and we are the type of people we are working honestly in our relationship with god uh, and and that's, that is a beautiful, wonderful thing that if anybody would stop and look and come in here and stop and look, that's what they would find here. Uh, but that the, the culture sort of pigeonholes us into a box which is, you know, ridiculously prim, prim and proper in a savage and uh, terrible world. Uh, and so we're not like that. And so how does that apply to today's parable? Jesus is messing with people's expectations about his teaching and about uh, what it means to be a Christian. And he's getting to a place and he does it beautifully, but he's going on a, a little bit of a journey to get there. And so uh, anybody, and this is, this is really my theme here overall, anybody who allows Jesus to be who he really is in the Bible is going to be surprised. Anybody. Now, I'm talking about Jesus of the Bible. Anybody who takes Jesus seriously and allows Jesus to be who, who he really is is going to be surprised. He doesn't fit into a box. That doesn't mean we don't have a faith and a relationship with him. Of course we do. But he surprises us. That's my point. Jesus surprises us. So in this parable, we're going to lay aside Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn for, uh, for now. Uh, in this parable, we just, you know, as a reminder of what parables are and how they function. It's a story told by Jesus that obviously has a lesson as a conclusion. Uh, there's usually a, a comparison, like in our particular case, you can't serve both God and mammon, God and money. Uh, there are details, the story that Jesus tells us, there are details that function as part of the story and reinforce the main point, but may, sometimes we take those as lessons and maybe we shouldn't. And, but Jesus uses stark imagery and contrasts and even comic and burlesque situations. So in this particular parable today, you've got this king or this, uh, this very, very wealthy person who hears that their man, the manager of their affairs has been, uh, uh, has been wasting resources, is what it says specifically. And that, uh, so he calls him in, the king or this very wealthy person, calls this manager in and says, hey, what's this I hear? Bring your accounts and we're going to have a reckoning, basically, is, is what, the, what, the, what the story is, what is, being, uh, what is being proposed to us here. So now it gets interesting. And so this is, again, Jesus telling this story. And this is pretty much he's talking to his disciples right here. So the parable continues. Jesus says, so the guy, the manager is saying, what am I going to do? I don't like digging ditches. I don't want to work at McDonald's or something of that sort. What am I going to do? I know I'm going to go and I'm going to talk to the people that owe this guy money that I've been working with. I'm going to fix this. So the story continues. Jesus says, so this manager goes to one guy. How much does, do you owe my master? <clears throat> 800 gallons of olive oil. Well, let's, you know, let's tear up that bell, write up a new one, call it 400. And then a similar thing with somebody else and wheat. Uh, owes 100 bushels of wheat. 
tear that bill up. Let's make it 50, something of that nature, okay? That's, it's at this point in the parable where I'm saying, what is going on here? This is, wait a sec, is this good, what this guy is doing? He's cheating his master. He's been caught cheating, and he's cheating some more. So what the hecky noodle is going on here? This doesn't make sense. Why is Jesus doing this? This doesn't make sense. It's irregular. It's eccentric. It doesn't fit with my preconceptions of what a parable should be. Oh, guess what? That's exactly what Jesus is trying to do. So as I was looking at this parable and these questions going off in my mind, I did find out that really what that what this particular manager is doing, who is in deep trouble, what he's actually doing is he's eliminating the, uh, the carrying charges that he added to the original bill. So his master is going to get the right amount of money or the right amount of gallons of olive oil or the right amount of bushels, but he's not, the manager's not going to get his commission. What the guy is doing is he's eliminating his commission and the, the uh, king, the rich person, will get every nickel owed to him. He's not being cheated that way but this guy is eliminating his commission so that begins to make a little bit more sense so Jesus is not recommending that if you get into trouble you cheat your way out of it not at all what this guy is doing is in fact uh, legitimate he's eliminating his own commission out of this and so that's an important point of all this, okay? So the story goes on, and then the, the odd thing is that the master hears about this, the king or whoever he is, and says, well, that was pretty smart. Good job. And so he, he commends this manager for doing what he did. So this manager is referred to as being shrewd now so here's a an interesting thing that jesus said that has always stuck with me and i i, I don't fully understand it be wise as serpents but innocent as doves now is anything about being a serpent a positive correlation in the bible not really but there's something here that Jesus is talking about is that, and I think this is what it gets down to is that, uh, and so back to our picture from African Queen, you look at the brother and the sisters, the missionaries in the jungles of Africa, and they're very naive. They're very naive and they're out of place really because of their naivete. Whereas the riverboat captain, Humphrey Bogart, he is not naive. He's a man of the world. He knows how things work. He's seen it all, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and so the, the, the beauty of this situation is, uh, you know, we have so much in the Bible of Jesus' teachings uh, that encourage us to, to uh, focus on, on being just and being kind and being righteous and being, uh, and all that is good. And Jesus absolutely says all of this stuff and everything. But I think Jesus uses this particular parable. He says, so yes, we should be just and kind and righteous and, and all these good things and everything, but let's not be stupid about it. Let's not be naive. Okay, work uh, the best, absolute, the best that you can to be, to have this, this ethic of justice, this ethic of truthfulness, this ethic of honesty, this ethic of, of fair dealing and, and all of this, and kindness and justice and everything. But I think he also says, let's not be stupid about this. And that's, that is my paraphrase of what he's saying. Also, very, very importantly, he's saying, don't put your faith in your bank account. Don't put your faith in your, in, uh, in your retirement account. Don't put your faith, definitely don't put your faith in Social Security. Uh, put your faith in God. Now, you certainly do need to use your money to your advantage to help you. That's why it's there. You can use it ethically and, and rightly. No problem there, for sure. But don't be stupid about this stuff. So anyways, a, a, a wise Christian would be somebody that is just, that is kind, that is uh, outgoing, that is honest and fair dealing and, and everything, but they don't give away the store to every person that they meet. Does that make sense? 
They don't give away the store. They, they're not stupid about their giving. They're not stupid about how, uh, how they trust other people, that they're, it's not a naive. So here's a thought. Can somebody be a faithful Christian and also be wise in, in a worldly sense? I think so. And I think that, that, you know, one thing it says about God is that God isn't fooled and he understands the working of the human heart. And so we can't put anything over on him. Guess what? You know, there it is. We can't put anything over on him. But I think this parable functions right here to say, hey, smarten up, guys. Uh, don't put your trust into money. Don't put your trust into Social Security. Don't put your trust into all of these different things that you need and you need to use well. Put your trust in God and put your faith in God. And then use the money. Don't let it rule you. Use it properly. Make friends for yourself. Do this. Do this kind of thing. Give away here. But don't give away the store to every person that you meet. So that's where I came to with this whole thing. Don't trust in your earthly possessions to save you. Don't put your faith in your bank account, retirement fund, money. Earthly benefits, however, can be used to benefit the kingdom. And don't be greedy for yourself. Share your wealth. And, uh, but also, if you're going to be faithful, be faithful in little things, and then God will trust you with big things. And that's a key, key part of this parable. Be faithful in the little things. And then God is going to trust you with being faithful in the big things. And so that's where we end up. That's where, that's where the point of this story is. You know, Jesus was no fool. And he knew uh, exactly what went on in the human heart. And, you know, he did say, you know, behold, the lilies of the field, they neither toil nor, nor reap, but uh, God takes care of God knows each and every one of them. It's the sparrows of the air. He did say that, and it's all true, all completely true, absolutely, from the word of God. But he's saying, don't be stupid about this. Be smart. Don't be naive. Use your worldly possessions in a godly way to help people and be smart about this stuff. And then God will recognize if you're faithful in a little, you will also be faithful in a lot, and he will use you. We are, uh, our lives are not our own. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, that uh, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And so that's, that is really the way God sees us. So let's be smart. And, and one of the th things I love about Sutton Free Will Baptist Church is that the, faithful is, the faith is here. The trust in God is here. But we're not stupid about how we do stuff here. We're pretty smart. Now, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the work of, of competent, intelligent, faithful Christian people that we have here. Uh, and so we're okay in difficult times like this. We'd, we'd love to have a full church and everything like that. But right now, what are we doing? We're taking care of the business that we need to take care of. We're faithfully here. We pray. We we. Uh, read from the Bible, we share fellowship, we focus on Jesus, and we're taking care of those things that matter. But we're not naive, and we're not stupid about how we do this. And so there is a, there is a simplicity in the, in the very most beautiful way to what we do here. There's a simplicity and a beauty that God recognizes and God sees. And so we're not like the brother and sister that we're wearing pure white, uh, you know, uh, clothes that they were sweating in in 100 degree heat were, were practical. And so I think this is a lesson for us that Jesus sees the beauty and the simplicity and the love and the power that, that he has placed here, that we're using that well and that, that we're doing exactly what God wants with that. Now, just we need to remember that should God take this fellowship and take this church to a place of, of greatness, uh, which maybe he will do. Uh, 
that we won't lose that simplicity and that we won't lose that charm and that, that beauty that God has installed here. We are faithful in those little things and we will be faithful in what more God brings us. But this parable serves to remind us, let's not be stupid, let's be smart about this. Amen? Our last hymn, number 67, Ye Servants of God, Your Master Proclaim. 67. <clears throat>